We'll turn to the book of Colossians chapter 2, and we'll consider today verses 8 through 15. Now that's a good bit of real estate for us to try to consider today, so we'll be a little more brief with the introduction. You know, this book of Colossians is one in which the Apostle Paul, troubled at a situation affecting the church here at Colossae, writes to this faithful band of believers, this loving group of Christians, and he tries to help them, warn them, and deliver them from some threats that are looming in their culture and presumably beginning to affect them. As we begin to go into some of those threats, which we will do probably next week, just to summarize the trouble that affected them or threatened them today, Colossae was a town in which was a, for lack of a better word, thriving cult of ascetic angel worshipers, okay? So maybe we could say that again. A thriving cult of ascetic angel worshipers. So just to unpack that and break it down for you briefly, there was a cult in Colossae that we'll look at in more specific detail next time. They worshiped angels. Now, if you're a Christian, who is it that you worship? Well, you worship Christ. You worship God, and you worship God alone. These angel worshipers, it's believed that they were, in some sense, either Jewish or affected by Judaism because they were also ascetic. And what that means is they taught, as we'll see in an upcoming message, touch not, taste not, handle not. They taught that spiritual fulfillment was through the obeying of rules. Spiritual fulfillment through the obeying of rules. And so they wouldn't eat certain things that God says they could eat. They wouldn't do certain things that God doesn't tell them not to do. And this had become a form, a threatening form of legalism to the church at Colossae. One of the greatest threats to Christianity in any location at any given time is legalism. It might not come from a cult of angel worshipers. If someone came in here today and told you to worship Gabriel or Michael, you'd probably laugh at them and ask them to leave. I hope that you would ask them to stop talking about it and maybe to sit down and be quiet and listen to some sermons on it. We could have some impromptu sermons if someone were to come in here teaching such a message as that, in which we very forcefully tore down the idea of worshiping, uh, worshiping anything other than God. But, you know, legalism comes in and creeps into our mind and our thought in many ways, and it is a threat to us even today. It's, again, not from a cult of angel worshipers, but maybe from other Christians, maybe other ideas. We think in our mind, we have to do this that someone told us to do, or we can't do this that someone told us not to do in order to be spiritually fulfilled and to be holy. Now, where is the source of a Christian's holiness? Does it come from the things that they do? No. Your holiness comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave you his righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ. And he did everything needed to be righteous. He did nothing that would result in unrighteousness because he kept the law to a jot and a tittle. He obeyed every law, even the laws of men, as you see him paying taxes and giving tribute, as you see him never transgressing any commandment, you see him even obeying the commands that God would have us to obey in being baptized by John the Baptist. Suffer it to be so, for it becometh us to what? Fulfill, fulfill all righteousness. He kept every law that he was liable to keep. And he gave you his righteousness. And so my fulfillment of righteousness or my own personal satisfaction doesn't depend on and should not depend on the things that I do, but it should depend wholly on what I know and what I have experienced with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler. Your satisfaction and fulfillment in this life, what we'll see today, 
what makes you complete is found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I've entitled my message this morning, What Makes You Complete? What makes you complete? And I want that question, usually we don't title our sermons as a question, but I want that question as we introduce today's thoughts to you to resonate in your mind, to latch hold in your mind, to stay in your mind as we begin to go through some of the scripture that we look at today. Because I guarantee you that every single one of us in this room thinks there is something in this world that I don't feel that I have. And if I only had that thing, I think I'd be complete. More on that in a moment. We'll begin reading in verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. Paul's that reading. Now, we know what spoil means, and we'll say more about it in a minute, but anything that takes you away from Christ is attempting to spoil you. And Paul warns, beware lest any man should spoil you after anything that is not found in Christ. So, a little bit of a hint as to where we're going with this today. Anything that promises you fulfillment that is not in Christ, you need to beware of. Beware lest any man should spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins... And the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Remember, they're being threatened by people who make rules. Jesus does what? He takes out the ordinances which were against us, nailing them to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, it being his death upon the cross. Now that's a lot to try to go through today. And so we'll be a little more brief with each point than maybe we would like to. This, again, is a very condensed book. There's, it's concentrated, as it were. You know, you... My, my dad, let me, let me give you a funny dad story. We talk about things that are concentrated. A few years ago, he was going to do mom a favor and clean the kitchen floor. Mom had some soap, and it was concentrated. Well, concentrated means that you take this raw ingredient and maybe add one part of it to 100 parts of water, and you come up with a cleaning solution that you use to clean the floor. Dad's philosophy, whether it be vitamins, torque on a bolt, or anything else, has been if a little is good... A lot is better. Well, he decides to pour the concentrated solution on the floor, scrub it around with a mop, walk away, and say, honey, I cleaned the floor. She comes home, and it felt like she was wearing gravity boots because when the foot hit the floor, it stuck. And when it came up with force, it was with a whoosh noise and feeling. He used concentrated material instead of diluting it. I remind you that the book of Colossians is so very concentrated. We can make a sermon out of every single statement that Paul gave in every single verse that we read to you momentarily, or moments ago, rather. Let's go back to verse 8 and begin digging into it. Beware lest any man spoil you. Now, as I was reading this today, um, the last thing that I do before I try to get 
up before you is to go through each and every word and, and maybe read through this, even in the original language, and look at words that maybe I don't notice something significant about in the English language. You don't have to do that to know what the Bible says, but it's just a habit that I have and a, an enjoyable hobby that I have. What's so interesting about that word beware, the word in the original language is literally the word for see in the Greek language today. Now, what's significant about that in my mind? When Greeks say they see something, the word that they use is literally the word here for beware. What might Paul be telling us to do as it relates to this philosophy and vain deceit and the threat that's looming? To look, beware, look out. Now, we've made this point several times in this series about beware of, whether it be dog or beware of landmines or beware of undetonated ordinance or, or whatever it is in the world that threatens you, you want to beware. What I want you to get out of that word beware, to us, we, we know be aware or be concerned, be alert, but I want you to connect the concept of sight with that concept of being aware of something, beware to an English person, or look to someone who speaks Greek and sees that word. How might we beware of the threats that threaten us as disciples of Christ? We have to be looking, be on the lookout for the threats. Beware. Look. Now, what are some opposites of the concept of beware or look? Well, you could be asleep. You know, there were times that Jesus came to the disciples and they were supposed to be watching. They didn't watch because they fell asleep. And he would say, could you not watch with me for just a short period of hours? The night that Jesus was arrested before he was crucified, those are literally the words. Could you not watch? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. And yet what do they do? They fall asleep. When Scripture calls on us to be sober and vigilant and all of those words... They communicate to us that we walk circumspectly, looking in every direction, always on the alert for things that could threaten the soundness of yourself personally and this particular church body, which threaten us in ways that we don't even understand or perceive. And so beware means literally be on the lookout. Look, look, see, always have your eyes open that you know when the enemy approaches. You know, in the Old Testament, they have these walled cities because they're all the time being threatened by some other imposing force, some other country, some other military. What do they place upon the walls of those cities? They place watchmen. Watchmen upon the walls. What do the watchmen do? Well, by the title, watchmen, the root of that watch, you know what they do without me telling you. They are on the lookout. They look and they see, and when the enemy comes, what is the next thing that they do? They sound an alarm by the blowing of a trumpet, and it allows those that hear that particular blast on the trumpet to know that is the alarm warning of an impending military. They had different blasts to communicate different things. The trumpet was loud, and you hear it. And when you hear it, you know what is being communicated. If you hear a tornado siren, you're pretty familiar with a tornado siren here in Alabama. When you hear a tornado siren, you know a tornado is coming, unless, of course, it's on the first Wednesday at noon, and then you know it's just a test of the tornado siren system. But if you're outside and you hear that siren, then you know a tornado is in your area, and you're at risk, and you go take cover. The watchmen on the walls are to look and see and warn Paul compares that to the gospel ministry when he says, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare to the battle? And so gospel ministers are watchmen on the wall that blow the trump, as it were, that sound the message of warning to God's people. And that's exactly what the apostle Paul is doing here. Beware, watch, look. When Paul says walk circumspectly elsewhere, circum means circle, spect is to look, looking every direction every direction to beware of the teaching of the enemy. We don't like to think of people who teach false doctrine as your enemy, but 
Please understand, whether it be Islam or Buddhism or New Age mysticism or some of the cults that name the name of Christ, please understand what they teach is your enemy. And the false teachers that head up those organizations are, wait for it, your enemy. We sometimes look at it as, well, they're nice folks. I'm, I'm, they love you know, the same sort of things that we love just outside of religion. No, 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 no. They're your enemy. Don't be brought under their teaching. Now, I'm going to digress from the notes here just a minute. You look at the backstory of the people that Christians spend hours each week listening to. You ever look up some of these people's religious persuasion? Some of them are New Age mystics. I've got one particular in mind. One of them belongs to a very fast-growing religion in this country that is an impersonation of Christianity and a cult. If you want to know these people in particular, I'll tell you after. I'm not going to say it over the, over the live stream. You start looking at these people, and none of them agree with you on what the Bible teaches, and yet Christians spend eight hours a day listening to this stuff. And, and a lot of times, they come to church expecting to hear the same thing. But we're not going to hear the same thing because we're not teaching the same thing. We're not the same people. Beware who you listen to. Beware. There are people today, and none of this is planned, there are people today that want to bring you under their captivity in what they teach, and they make merchandise of you, maybe through ad revenue, maybe through selling books. But if what they teach about Christ is not right, I want you to cut the radio off, cut the TV off, turn it on something else, play a board game with your family. Stop giving those people influence in our lives. I'm a watchman, and I'm sounding the alarm. Beware lest any man spoil you through. Now, in this particular case, Paul is going to list two threats from two different sources. Two threats through two different sources. Number one, philosophy. Number two, vain deceit. These two threats, philosophy and vain deceit, are after a couple of things. Number one, the tradition of men, and number two, the rudiments of this world. And as you see the negative there, and not after Christ. In other words, the root of this teaching is not Christ. In other words, to quote Paul in other places, you have not so learned Christ. You have not so learned Christ. We want everything that we believe about every subject to be grounded in what Christ teaches, who Christ is, and therefore it comes from the Word of God. If it's not biblical, you need to be suspect of it. Be suspicious. Number one, philosophy. Now, we use that word today, and it's used in a couple of different ways. First of all, in a very generic sense, it's used to have reference to your mentality about life in any subject. You might say, my personal philosophy is X, Y, Z, and it might have reference to the way that you upkeep your health, to the way that you upkeep your lawn, to the way that you clean your house. You say, my philosophy is to you know, clean this part of the house on this day and that part of the house on another day. We use it very generically to simply have reference to a mentality. Right, my philosophy on this, my personal philosophy. How many of you use that language or have heard that language? Nobody here. I remember this is a primitive Baptist church, and so we are not interactive. <laughs> Unless the preacher says something you don't like, and then you might become a little interactive. Philosophy also, in the English language, to us today, has reference to, historically, in a historic sense, the profession and musings of the philosophers. Okay, So you might have reference to Plato, or Socrates, or... Countless other people, Menander, Epimenides. I mean, just the list goes on and on and on and on. If you've never been bored to tears to the point of Lord Jesus come quickly, pull up sometime on a podcasting app and listen to college lectures on philosophy. Nothing will make you want, you say, I have trouble sleeping at night. Let me recommend to you a course because it's so boring for me to listen to the teaching on what the philosophers thought and what they believed. Philosophy in that sense has reference to the teaching of the philosophers, teaching of the philosophers. Now, that does not mean that the philosophers or philosophy is always in agreement. Okay, so we say philosophy, we don't mean that there's some lockstep entity in the world 
that is always in agreement with itself. A good example of this from Scripture is Acts chapter 17. As Paul is on Mars Hill, Areopagus, Ares Rock, he encounters certain of the philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics. And both of these two viewpoints, these two different schools of philosophical thought, team up to listen to him and oppose him. As they said, what will this babbler say? Did you know Epicureans and Stoics are opposing schools of philosophical thought? The Epicureans are more hedonistic. Hedonism is a school of philosophy that teaches that pleasure is the greatest good. And so if it feels good, do it as long as it doesn't hurt another person and cause them displeasure. And so the Epicureans, being of that school of thought, would have believed that indulging in pleasure and emotion well, that's the greatest thing that an individual can experience in the world. And that is what the flesh tells you, isn't it? The Stoics, on the other hand, taught self-denial. They were more similar to, in modern pop culture, the Vulcans of Star Trek, where emotion is to be suppressed and logic and reason and wisdom is to rule the day. And that is the greatest good. These two people, these two philosophical schools, don't agree on very much, do they? And yet they both come together against the Christian to oppose the Christian because the enemy of my enemy is what? So many times, my friend. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so just because we say philosophy, don't get the impression that this umbrella term means that everyone or every school of philosophical thought is in agreement. In this particular passage, what Paul means by philosophy, and it's the only occurrence of the Greek, or excuse me, the English word philosophy in the New Testament, what Paul means by the word philosophy is the teaching of the ascetic angel worshiping cult. So when he says philosophy here, he doesn't necessarily, though it would apply, have reference to the Epicureans or the hedonistic people. It doesn't necessarily apply to any particular philosopher of Greek history or all of the philosophers in Greek history. It has reference to the teaching of the particular threat in this day to this people, which again is a cult of ascetic, self-denying, extreme self-denying to the point of you know, no food, no drink, angel worshipers. To the cult, the teaching of the cult. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. To remind you of what we said about that word spoil last week. To the victor goes the spoils. Spoil is usually what was taken as a possession after an, a military came in and took over another country. And just again, to the victor goes the spoils. We know what that word means. Don't think of it in terms of this food in the refrigerator is spoiled and it's gone bad, but think of it in terms of taken captive. The word spoil means to take something captive. Now, by the way, this word would be used again in the last verse that we want to consider today. Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. And so when we begin to look at what actually makes us complete... As you're looking for satisfaction and fulfillment in this world, Jesus spoiled the principalities and the powers that threaten us in any sense, whether intellectually, philosophically, whether it be politically or militarily. Jesus has power. He has spoiled all principality and power, even angels. He's of greater power and authority than the angels. Jesus crushed the head of a fallen cherub named Satan upon the cross of Calvary. He spoiled Satan on the cross of Calvary, crushing his head, defeating him who had power over death, according to the book of Hebrews. And so whether you're talking about political, spiritual, or intellectual enemies, Christ has spoiled them. If we didn't have time to elaborate at the end for the sake of time, let that suffice. Christ has spoiled all of his enemies. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Again, the teaching of the ascetic angel-worshipping cult. Just a little note on philosophy before we move past it. The word or the phrase, the, the syllable rather, sophie in philosophy, the sophie there, 
actually comes from the Greek word for wisdom. And it, this word philosophy transliterates right into the English language, but the sophi there is the word when Paul talks about the wisdom of God being greater than the wisdom of men and God with his foolishness. He doesn't have foolishness, but if he did, the foolishness of God would be greater than the wisdom of men and how he makes an open show of it. The word there, wisdom, is this word that comes into the English language as this last portion of the word philosophy, these last two syllables, sophie. And so literally that word means wisdom. If you want further reading on that, I'd encourage you to go read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this week as an addendum to this or a supplement to this. The next thing that he warns against is vain deceit. And we talked about this last week. Eve was deceived by Satan, the deception of Satan in the Garden of Eden. And she gave to Adam. Adam willingly partakes and eats and sins and falls. But deception, deceit, means literally to trick. And this sort of trickery, this sort of deceit or deception is vain. That means that it's pointless. Now we look at the philosophies of this world and we think if I only had that, I would be happy. I would be fulfilled. But understand, not only is it a philosophy, but it's a vain deception. Vain doesn't mean what we so often use it to mean. I look in the mirror, I like what I see, and I'm full of vanity. That happens less and less, by the way, the older one gets. I'm like, you know what? Wow, all these spots and crow's feet and white hair in places that they should not be white. I get it. Let's leave the haze on the mirror when we get out of the shower, right? It doesn't mean vain as in egotistical, but vain as in pointless. When Solomon said all is vanity and vexation of spirit, vanity there means literally pointlessness. The deception is pointless. There's no benefit to you in it, which is why so many people that chase so many different things in the world thinking it will give them fulfillment are unhappy people. Vain deceit after, implying source, after. The root of it is, number one, the tradition of men, and number two, the rudiments of this world. So many times we have used that in in PB, recent history, to say that we shouldn't be married to tradition. And let me just tell you, tradition's not a four-letter word. Obviously, it has more than four letters, but As an idiom or figure of speech, tradition is not a four-letter word. Every group of people, every order of faith has tradition. We just have to make sure that tradition answers to the Word of God and not the other way around. We had the tradition that we didn't meet every Sunday. Let me just tell you that that's one of the most harmful things for a church to continue to do in today's time. It's a tradition. It's not biblical. Biblically, we're supposed to be in God's house every Sunday. Health-wise... What is expedient is for a group of people to meet together as a church, not only every Lord's Day, but as often as they can. That's what's biblical and helpful and expedient. That's what gives the church greater health. But the tradition was, well, we meet once a month or twice a month. When Paul is talking about the tradition of men, he doesn't have reference to traditions that they had embraced, and we shouldn't take it out of context and use it that way. What he has reference to under the term or title, tradition of men, are, is again the teachings of the ascetic, angel-worshiping cult. But you can apply it to any teaching of men, any teaching of a man that is not rooted and grounded in the Word of God. If it comes from humanity rather than Scripture, it is a tradition of men and we ought to be suspicious of it tradition of men after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ's rudiments means elementary or fundamental teaching. In the hymnal that our church used, I know we used it at one time because there's a box of them deteriorating in the attic and several of them I brought down to rescue, the Casey hymnal. In the beginning of that old hymnal, there's a section called the rudiments of music. Anytime I hear the word rudiments, I think about that particular hymnal and that particular section. In the section, The Rudiments of Music, you have a brief breakdown on pitch and the length of notes, what each note means, what the bar lines mean, the staff means. 
and it's the rudiments of music. It's elementary musical instruction to help you be able to sing. What this church of the Colossians is affected with are philosophies and vain deceit built around the traditions of men and the rudiments or the elementary fundamental teachings of this world. Now, how might that affect us today? Let's look at verse 10 and do some plugging in of information. And ye are complete in him. Ye are complete in him. According to the rudiments, the fundamental teachings of men, there are things in the world that will make you complete and will make you happy. What might those things be? Oh, I don't know. Do you have Instagram? Well, if you have Instagram, what Instagram will tell you will make you happy is a, a washboard abdomen. Now, we just had Thanksgiving. How many people still have a washboard abdomen that started with one this past week? Other than Elijah, probably nobody. That kid has two hollow legs. I don't know where he puts all the food he eats, but he never puts on an ounce of body fat. My dad told me, because I used to have that physique, you're going to be really glad when you get to about 40. Well, I don't have a washboard ab. You know what? A washboard abdomen is not going to make you fulfilled in life. It's not going to make you happy. You might be a little happy in the flesh, but you have to continually chase it. There's not lasting fulfillment in that. How about the beautiful face that you think you ought to have? I just wish I had a, a prettier face. And so they go to a doctor, and the doctor mutilates the bone structure of their face and changes the face that they got. And there are people that think, if I just look like this person, I'd be happy. You're not going to be fulfilled in that. People spend billions of dollars a year in this country on that, and it does not give them lasting fulfillment. Guess what? One day, everything but the plastic <laughs> that they put in the surgery is going to be wasting away as the body turns to dust. None of that is lasting. Those of you here that are now over 80 years old, you can look around to these younger folks later and tell them, look, there's coming a day when it doesn't matter how hard you try because you and I are all sinners. We're going to get old and wax old as the, the garment. Your vision's going to fail. Your teeth may fall out. Your hearing will go away. Let me tell you, one of the most, one of the most said words in my house is, huh? 20-something years of playing the trumpet has deafened me so that when there's a lot of noise, I can't hear what somebody's saying. And it makes Rachel so mad because she'll say it, and then I'll say, what? And then she'll say it, and I'll say, I can't hear you, and she gets impatient with me. I know that's hard to believe. Somebody be impatient with me. We wax old. We chase youth, and it's fleeting. What about finances? People just think, if I had X, Y, Z dollars in the bank, oh, I'd be a fulfilled person. I think one thing that the past 15 years has taught us, we had the 08 collapse, and then it, it builds back, and then we have the, the COVID collapse, and it builds back, and now the stock market looks like the scream machine and six flags over Georgia. You can tell how long it's been since I've been there. It's just up and down and up and down and up and down. Wealth is fleeting. Scripture talks about it as growing wings and flying away. So many people in this country chase it. If I only had that, oh, I'd be happy. And then you, you learn and you listen to some of the wealthiest people in this world, and they tell you, if I just had one more dollar, I'll be satisfied if I get one more, one more, one more. You start realizing that it doesn't satisfy you. What about lust? Young people around this world chasing pleasure through lust, and it's one one experience after another, after another, after another, one high after another to those that are addicted to drugs, seeking fulfillment, wanting that high, that fix. And it just leaves them feeling hollow, empty, full of regret and remorse. What do you find completeness in? What do you find in this world that gives you real Lasting, permanent, enduring, overflowing completeness. Only through Christ. The only thing that will make you 
lastingly fulfilled is Christ. Now, am I telling you, you don't have to worry about getting a job and earning a living and saving for retirement and staying in shape? No, I'm not telling you any of that. You need to do those things, but not to find fulfillment. In fact, you can be so fulfilled in Christ that in those other things, Christ begins to take root and affect how you do those there are so many in mind. I didn't write any of them down because so many of them just come to you. Your, your family. Having perfect children. You know, that was ruined when Adam had children. And yet somehow we think, I'll just be fulfilled if my kids are the perfect kids that I want them to be because it makes me look like a good parent. Do you know what those kids are? They're you multiplied. What are you, Adam, multiplied? Maybe the flagship marriage that everybody wants as a status, uh, status symbol as Christians. We don't want people to know when we have issues. We don't want people to know that we're really fallen. And yes, every married couple has a spat from time to time. Maybe I can make that happen in the world to be fulfilled. There's always going to be a problem, something to work through. But, but listen, when Christ is the center focus, how does that begin to change the way that you interact with one another in your marriage? It changes it. Or with your children, it changes it. Does that mean it's always perfect? No. About 1130 last night when the floor wasn't vacuumed like it was supposed to be in somebody's room, let me tell you, Ben Winslet became little Nick Saban and he came unglued. We all have issues that we have to deal with. Rachel somewhere said amen. Poor woman's trying to sleep after working on stuff all day and there I am mad at a vacuum cleaner. The only fulfillment that we have in this world that's lasting is Christ. When we put Christ first, it begins to affect the other areas that we try to work on in our lives. It's not that we compartmentalize this off and the only thing we do is pursue Christ in the sense that we go to church and we seek only the kingdom. No, we do all that we do with Christ as the center and it changes everything. It totally restructures your life. You're fulfilled in Christ, and so the marriage is better, and you're, full, you're fulfilled in Christ in the marriage. You're, you are fulfilled in Christ, and so when you go to the workplace, you are fulfilled in Christ at work. Suddenly, everything's about Christ, and suddenly you find real fulfillment that so many people in this world chase after the traditions of men and the vain deceit of Satan that if I only had this, I would be a happy man or a happy woman. These are, again, traditions of men, cultural, not Christian, rudiments of the world, the elementary or fundamental teachings of the world. The remedy, verse 9, we skipped over this, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The remedy to completeness and fulfillment in this life is Christ. Now, we love that passage. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If you had, Brother Ben, to go to a scripture to teach the deity of Christ, that God was manifest in human flesh, what passage would you choose? This and John chapter 1. How many times have you heard me quote John chapter 1? In him was, uh, excuse me, in the wor beginning was the word, the word was... With him and the word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. You've heard me quote that and read that hundreds of times because it asserts the deity, the divinity of Christ. And yet we find it right here in the midst of a context about completeness. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What might be Paul's point if the fullness of the Godhead was contained in the man, Christ Jesus, bodily, if the fullness of the Godhead was in Christ Jesus, then I ought to find completeness and fulfillment in Christ in ways that I can't through this world. If the Godhead is in all fullness in Christ, shouldn't he be all my fulfillment and completeness? Should I look to anything else when this man is literally God incarnate? Oh, he was made a little lower than the angels. 
for a little period of time, but it was God, God who took upon human flesh, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, Philippians chapter 2. If in him dwells all fullness of the Godhead bodily, then shouldn't I be satisfied with him? I should be. Yea, I will be. You could take all the other things of this world that men put value on. And let me tell you, there's a whole list of them. I was thinking last night, and I hate to compare it to sports. We have a rule here where we don't mention the Iron Bowl the day after the Iron Bowl. Because this is not, this is not a place about sports and football. We want to put our devotion on Christ. But I don't care what team you pull for. Last night was terrible. For 58 minutes for one side and then for the four overtimes for the other, think about how fleeting that was if you were pulling for one team or the other. You were disappointed for the entire game for one team, and then when it's over, if you're for the other team, you're disappointed. Did you think you were going to get fulfillment out of that? Is it lasting? they got to do it again next year. A buddy of mine posted on Facebook. He's younger than me and had a heart attack earlier this year. He said, I know a good heart doctor. I know a good heart doctor in Birmingham. You mean in a year from now they got to go through that again? I don't want to watch that game. I muted it. I, I studied Greek and Hebrew and Spanish, and I read this passage over and over again. I just couldn't take it. Couldn't take it. There's no fulfillment there. There's no fulfillment there. Not lastingly, but there's always fulfillment in Christ. In Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I can find lasting, perfect, complete fulfillment in Christ. What makes you feel complete? Is it your, your education? Oh, I just need another degree and I'll feel complete. Your, your marriage? A trophy spouse? The perfect kids? Gratification of the flesh? Substances to abuse? Looking like some celebrity and having the the face and the physique to be idolized by strangers on social media? Let me tell you, the only thing that will fulfill us is Christ. And you know what's so great about it? Yeah, this is all off the cuff. You know what's so great about it? He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never lets you down. He never fails you. He never abandons you. He never leaves you. His glory is never diminished. His love never fades. When iniquity abounds, the love of many wax cold. That's why America looks like it does today, because iniquity abounds. And love waxes cold. His love never waxes cold. He's always with you. And we can find lasting fulfillment in Him. Got to move on. He is head of all principality and power, in whom also. Now, beginning in verse 11 and continuing through verse 15, Paul runs the gamut of our experience with Christ. Running the gamut is a figure of speech or an idiom that means to display the complete range of something. Running the gamut. I think we all knew what that meant, even if we don't necessarily know how to say what that meant. To display the complete range of something. Beginning in verse 11, Paul runs the gamut of our experience with Christ. As he does this, he blends various Christological and soteriological topics. That's the doctrine of salvation, such as the new birth which he describes both in terms of a circumcision but also a resurrection, quickening. He talks about baptism, which is in likeness of his death. He talks about the cross and forgiveness and redemption. And he talks about Christ's open triumph over even the governments of this world putting them to an open shame, as it were, triumphing over them publicly. He does all of this to 
share with us the scope of our completion in him. In him, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Given that this particular ascetic cult of angel worshipers was likely of a either Jewish or Judaizer origin, maybe they weren't Jewish, maybe they were Gentile, but they had taken Judaism and created this sort of heretical cult around some of the don't eat, don't touch, don't wear teachings of Judaism and of the Old Testament. Now, now why might God say in the Old Testament, don't eat pork, don't eat shrimp, don't eat catfish, don't wear blended garments? Because God in the Old Testament was pointing us to Christ, teaching us there's a difference in the clean and the unclean. We are the unclean. Christ was the clean, by the way. If you think, well, okay, we're the clean and the other people are unclean. No, Christ is the clean and you and I are the unclean. And the clean was given for the unclean, which is why animals without spot or blemish was offered for sinners. All that points to Christ. But Christ fulfills it. Well, these Judaizing people, they take these commandments and they build this scheme of lasting fulfillment and personal righteousness through the do's and the do-nots. The do's and the do-nots. One of the do's in the Old Testament was what? Circumcision. Genesis 17, you'll circumcise every male heir that is born. I'm not going to say a whole lot about it because of the graphic nature, but you know what it is. And you know what he's referring to. Paul here tells us that there is a circumcision that is made without hands. Now, there are some people who read into that baptism because it's in the next verse. And might I just emphasize, perhaps even sarcastically, the words, without hands. Every single person I baptize, I baptize with my hands. He's not talking about baptism when he talks about circumcision. Circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ has, in a sense, circumcised your heart. In that, which is a medical act today, something is taken away, and in the Old Testament that was symbolic of the taking away of the filth of the flesh. It's often pointed out that in the new birth, something is taken away and something is added. And in both of those cases, the circumcision, the taking away, and the something that is added, God writing his laws upon your heart, upon the fleshy tables of your heart, both are described in terms of being God only and not contributed to through human means. 2 Corinthians 3 says that God with his very own finger has written his law upon the fleshy tables of your heart. Who wrote the laws of God upon your heart? Did I? No, God did. Who took away the filth of the flesh in the new birth? God did. I can't take that away. That's why it's without hands. Circumcision here is a metaphor for the new birth. How do we know that? In the book of Romans chapter 2, which is very similar to this, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly referring to born-again people. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, a New Testament spiritual Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Now, why might Paul use this? Well, for obvious cultural reasons, it was an analogy they understood. But going back to Genesis 17, circumcision is the token of the covenant. Every male heir was to be circumcised or he would be cut off from his people. What's the token of this new covenant? Circumcision. Not in the flesh, but of the heart. In other words, we know we have this token of this covenant that we are a part of that covenant when God quickens us when we were dead in trespasses and in sins. New Testament circumcision is the new birth when God takes the filth of the flesh and he writes upon our heart his laws. And it is, again, just like the Old Testament, or in the Old Testament, rather, the token 
of this covenant. He goes on, buried with him in baptism. Now you're connected through Christ, connected to Christ through circumcision, which is again here referring to the new birth. In the Old Testament, a token of the covenant. In this next verse, you're also buried with him in baptism, wherein in baptism you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Now, a good way to understand this, baptism pictures the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And so we are planted and we are raised in the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection when we are baptized. This is through the faith of the operation of God. Baptism is the answer of a good conscience towards God, according to Peter in 1 Peter. Baptism being the answer of a good conscience, it is by what? It is by faith. Baptism is the answer of faith in the heart, the answer of a good conscience. When we hear the word and we believe, what are we commanded to do from Scripture? To take up our cross and be baptized in his name. And in baptism, we are planted, buried in his likeness, and raised in his likeness. And this corresponds to faith, which is what? Of the operation of God. Faith is of God operating on you who hath raised him from the dead. You have faith because of the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. Now, I warn you not to try to blend everything in these statements together as all the cross, all the new birth, because, again, he's running the gamut. And he talks about various concepts, blending them all together to paint with a broad brush the full scope of our completeness in Christ. And you, being dead in your sins, sounds like Ephesians 2, doesn't it? And the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him. You've been made alive with him, having forgiven you of all trespasses. When were you forgiven of all trespasses? When Jesus took away all your sins upon the cross. In other words... You've been baptized because you have faith. You have faith because you've been born again. You've been born again because he quickened you when you were dead. And he quickened you when you were dead because he forgave you of all trespasses. When Christ died for you upon the cross of Calvary, you had forgiveness from all your sins. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. We had broken the law, and the law condemned us. And so he blots it out. The ordinances, they were contrary to us. They condemned us. They convicted us, not because there was a problem with the law. The law is holy. They convicted us because there was a problem with us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet Jesus... He took this out of the way by nailing it to his cross. He fulfilled it. He kept it. He obeyed the law to a jot and a tittle. And when he was nailed to the tree, he was judged by God as if he had committed our iniquity, though he had committed none. And as my favorite verse says, he that knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We were guilty, and yet he suffered the penalty of our guilt upon the tree, upon the cross. And as he does, he takes it, the ordinance against us, out of the way. Now, if someone tells you, no, 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 you've got to be circumcised in the flesh, to be saved. You've got to keep the law of Moses to be saved. Acts chapter 15 presents that heresy. You remember this verse and you say, Upon the cross of Calvary, Jesus blotted out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us. He took it out of the way. He nailed it to his cross. And as he died and he was buried, and he rose again. He rises victoriously. We have risen in the new birth, and yet we have also, in a sense, symbolically, 
died and risen again as we followed him in baptism and were connected as a disciple in that way, you just think of the ways that Christ has given you completeness anytime someone in this world tries to sell you a philosophy or a legalism that they try to promise you peace and happiness and fulfillment with. Christ has taken it out of the way. You know what Paul says in Philippians? That he counts all of the things that this world finds in his day and age and in his culture to be a benefit as what? As but dung. You say that's graphic and gross. You shouldn't say that. He said that. And I want you to see how serious he is. It's counted as nothing but discardable waste. Something that you don't want on you. You don't want to be anywhere near. That's what he counts. Everything the world finds of value in his day and age. No wonder he says to live is Christ. It's an adjective meaning his life is Christ. The most important thing in his life. All right. Having spoiled principalities and powers, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them and it. Our scripture reading today was Psalm 2. Did you notice in Psalm 2 that the heathen raged, the people imagined a vain thing, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers took counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. That psalm is talking about the crucifixion. Jesus in the moment that they thought was defeat, was actually a victor over death, over sin, over Satan, over hell, over legalism, over anything else in this world that seeks to take us from Christ. Jesus spoiled principalities and power, took it captive, and made a show of it openly as he triumphed over them in it, that being his death. What's the moral of the story? Look at verse 16, which is where we'll pick up next time. Let no man, therefore, judge you. Let no man judge you. Why? Because you are complete and fulfilled in your Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this passage. We thank you for its teaching. Lord, we pray that it's been a message that's been easy to understand and encouraging. Help us, Lord, to tear down all of the vain philosophies and deceits in our own lives. We know, Lord, that it doesn't matter who is here in this room. There's always something we think, if I just had that, I'll be fulfilled. But, Lord, we know that the only way we can have fulfillment in our lives is through your Son, Jesus Christ. May we look at him. May we adore him. May we seek him. May we understand that we have righteousness and freedom and liberty and joy in him. Let us have peace in him. We pray, Lord, that you forgive us of our sins, especially, Lord, the sins of looking to anything else in this world for completeness and fulfillment. And we ask all this in his sweet name and say together, amen. Praise God from whom.